All right. Uh, we are in the middle of a message series uh, reading through the book of 1 Corinthians, and uh, we've titled this message series Crossroads, and our subtitle is The Intersection of Christ and Culture. And, and one of the things that I think is very interesting as we walk through 1 Corinthians together is what we're learning is that when Jesus intersects with us, everything is transformed. Everything is transformed when, when Jesus intersects with us. And uh, we're going to jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and 6 today. If you want to open your Bibles, you can turn there now. We're not going to get to that just yet. Uh, I want to give you some background this morning about what was going on in the city of Corinth in the first century and how similar it is to our American culture. We've talked about this the last several weeks. We have a lot in common with first century Corinth, which is really interesting. Uh, these chapters are going to address sexuality, like I mentioned earlier, and, and so uh, it, it's interesting how very highly sexualized first century Corinth was. Most of the people in Corinth literally worshipped a god by the name of Aphrodite, and uh, I've, I've got just a very modest image of Aphrodite here, but Aphrodite was the goddess of sex, and, and one of the prominent temples in the city of Corinth was a temple dedicated to the worship of sex. It was populated by temple prostitutes, and people would go there to worship Aphrodite with the temple prostitutes, and you can only imagine what that would have entailed. Uh, this week, I came across a slogan. I have never heard this before, but I discovered that the Corinthians had a slogan that they were proud of. Mistresses we keep for the sake of pleasure, concubines for the daily care of the body, and wives to bear us legitimate children. That was their pride, was how, how free they were with their sexuality. And when they talked about morality, they didn't have very many rules. Pretty much in Corinth, everything was permissible, and there were a few arbitrary boundaries, but for the most part, anything goes sexually in first century Corinth. Now, I don't have to tell you that we live in a culture that is also very highly sexualized. You know what I'm talking, uh, talking about. In, a, in many ways, Americans also worship at the altar of sexuality. And nobody embodies this better than Ma Madonna. You know, and, and those of you that came up in the 80s and the 90s, you remember how Madonna would mix faith and sexuality and worship and, and just mix the two. And, and, and it's really a prophetic statement about who Americans are. Many of us have worshiped at the altar of sexuality. And like the Corinthians, we have a few slogans that, that inform our sexual choices. Ours are shorter. One of them is YOLO. How many of you know YOLO? You only live once. And the implication of YOLO is I'm going to grab it when I have an opportunity because I want to suck the marrow out of life. I want to do everything I can because I only live once. That's, that's a motto of American culture. Another motto is FOMO which is the fear of missing out. And lots of people have made choices of what to do with their body because they just don't want to miss anything. And if my friends are doing it, I want to make sure I have similar experiences. And these are the mottos that a lot of us live by. And when it comes to morality, for a lot of Americans, we could probably even say for most Americans, what we would say is like the Corinthians, everything is permissible. But today, we do have one big boundary, and you'll hear about this a lot in the news or in training sessions at work or school or whatever. The boundary is as long as you're not hurting anybody. Do what you want to do. As long as you're not hurting anybody, as long as you're consenting adults, everything is permissible. That's kind of the American morality. And so this is why I say Americans have a lot in common with first Corinthian, uh, with first century Corinthians. Thank you, thank you, Luke. You, you should just help me today. The reason I say that is because um, this topic makes me nervous. Whew, I know, I know I got this. I have really good notes. 
God's got this. But if you want to help me, I'll take your help anytime. Just want you to know that. I, I was thinking this morning about, a, about something that I hear people say a lot. You've probably heard people say this. If God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, whoa. I don't like that statement. I don't like that statement because it misses God's heart. What did we sing? God, you're so good. I don't like that statement because God's heart is goodness and grace and love and forgiveness to his children whom he loves. And here's what I was thinking about as I was just meditating on that statement that I've heard so many times lately. First century Corinthians were just as sexually free as 21st century America. But God didn't send damnation on Corinth. He sent them a missionary. And he sent them the message of salvation and the message of freedom in Jesus. And I want you to, I, I want you to hang on to this today because, because we have an opportunity to connect with God no matter what has happened to us in our lives. God loves you. God loves you as a father. Even if you had a terrible father, God loves you like the father you always wished you had. And God is good. Now I've got my preach on. This is a hard topic for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons it's hard for me is because um, I've made... I've made mistakes in my life. I, um, I was exposed to pornography for the first time when I was in third grade. I was having a conversation with, this, with somebody this week and they were saying, man, um, culture has changed so much and the availability of pornography is everywhere. And, and you know what? I was in third grade in 1970. And I just walked into a corner store and pulled a magazine off the shelf and that was my first exposure to pornography. This has been a big temptation for lots of people since the beginning of time. The forms and the manifestations have just changed. But this is a hard topic and it's an important topic because God has lots to say about it and there's goodness for us when we bring ourselves to God. Do you hear what I'm saying? For me, that early exposure how old is an eight, uh, uh, third graders, maybe eight years old, I think it was eight or nine years old for me, that set up a lifetime of temptation and guilt and shame and struggle that as an eight-year-old, I wasn't ready for. And if I can do anything today to help some of you find freedom like the Lord has given me freedom, that's what I want to have happen today, okay? Because... God is so good. And today, what I hope is going to happen in this room is there's going to be some people that are going to be released from shame and released from struggle. I can't promise you that you'll be released from temptation because temptation is just with us. But when we press into the goodness of God, there's goodness that comes to us. And that's what I hope is going to happen today. Maybe we should just pray. Yeah. Jesus, I love who you are, and I love how you came to this earth to show us the heart of the Father. The heart of the Father that says, listen, this is how I created you. This is what I, this is what I envisioned for you. This is how I want to work in your life. And then Jesus, you died on the cross so that we could find freedom and forgiveness and wholeness and healing, all of those things through your death on the cross. And you rose from the dead, why? Because you conquered death, hell, and the grave and the grip that the devil has on our lives. You are alive, Jesus, and you are living in us for that purpose, to set us free to live in the presence of the Father who loves us so deeply.
So Jesus, do the work that you've, you've intended to do today in all of us. In Jesus' name, everybody say, so be it. So be it. Ah, you almost said amen. <laughs> so be it. Okay, let's jump into 1 Corinthians. Now, if you're in, um, if you're in a connection group, uh, you're going to be you're going to be reading First Corinthians five and six this week, and I I I'm not going to take the time today to to deal with a lot of stuff in in First Corinthians chapter five, but we're going to be in chapter six today, and, uh, and and I just made some choices about what I wanted to talk about today, and, and there's a couple of stuff, a couple of passages in chapter six that I want to share with you today and unpack. So First Corinthians chapter six. Uh, I want to start reading at verse 9. Okay, what are we hanging on to today? God's good. Okay, hang on to that because we're going to start reading in verse 9, and this is tough stuff. Okay, here we go. Paul says to the Christians in Corinth, he says, Do you not know that the, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the habitually drunk, nor verbal abusers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, chapters 5 and 6 are primarily about sexual immorality, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. But did you notice that this list is really broad? Okay? He's lumping a whole bunch of people all together, and he's saying, if you engage in these behaviors, what's the outcome? You're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? That's, a, that's a, a, a sobering warning. But here's what I want you to know as you just look at that list up on the screen. These descriptions are given to people who engage in unrighteous behavior. Everybody say the word behavior behavior. You might look at that list and say, man, those are a bunch of identities. Those are how people identify. Paul is using this list to describe people's behaviors, and that's so important because Paul has really good news for us in the very next verse. Let's go to the next verse. What he says is this, such were some of you. I remember when I read this verse for the first time as a young man, and I was struggling with temptation, and I was struggling with identity, and who am I, and how did God create me, and I'm so frustrated with a whole lot of things in my life, and, and I had failed, and I, I, had, I, I had sinned, and I, and I felt like God was really angry at me, and I came across this verse, and, and those five words just arrested me. Such were some of you. In other words, this is in your past. If you've come to Jesus, you have a brand new identity. And then Paul tells us what the identity is. It's up here. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of your God. You see, when you come to Jesus, he completely transforms your identity. Why is this important? Because if we adopt the wrong identity into our lives, if we believe the wrong things about ourselves, we are going to act out what we believe that we are. And what Paul is saying to us is, all of that stuff you used to do is in your past, and now God has given you the identity of washed, sanctified, and justified. This is good news. Let me just unpack this for you just briefly. And, and, and this is stuff you probably already know. But let me just help you picture this a little bit. What does the word washed mean? Well, it's like taking a shower or, or bathing your dog. We have a little dachshund. His name is Sammy. And for about two weeks, every time we cuddle with Sammy, any of the three of us say, wow, you smell really bad. Why don't you have a seat on the floor? Okay? But, but when mom gets hold of that little Sammy and she puts him in the sink and she lathers him up and she blows him dry and his hair is all white and fluffy and beautiful, man, I just want to hold him and smell him because he's so, it, it's just good to be with him, right? When you come to Jesus, friends, he washes you. And all of that stinky stuff, all of that past stuff, guilt 
shame, whatever it is that makes you feel like you smell bad. You know what? It, you know how you have you have you ever just looked at somebody and say, "I feel like I smell bad." Okay, yeah. okay, <laughs> like, like, do you ever feel that way inside? Okay, I just feel like I smell bad. Okay, when you come to Jesus, He gives you the best shower you've ever had in your life. You're washed. Now the word sanctified is a is a really really big churchy word that nobody uses in their normal English language. Sanctified is a churchy word that means you've been made holy. You've been made holy. The word holy means set apart. How many of you have have stuff in your home that you set apart just for special occasions? Okay, I'm thinking about Chris's great-grandmother's china. She was in the right place at the right time to get her great-grandmother's china, okay? It stays in a cabinet locked away. We use it on Thanksgiving or Christmas or special guests. And then we have everyday dishes, okay? Holy means you're set aside for what special purpose? For God's purpose. Holiness is not something that you achieve or that you earn. Do you see in this verse what it says? It says you were sanctified. You were made holy. It's it's something Jesus does for you. Bam. When you come to Jesus and he washes you, he also makes you holy. It's, It's your identity. Okay? Will you look at me right in the eye and say, I am holy? Okay, some of you had a hard time saying that, right? Because you still believe you have the identity of the previous verse, of all that stuff, all that unrighteous stuff. Listen, when you come to Jesus, he washes you and then he makes you holy. And then the last word, justified, uh, the Bible college definition of justified is just as if I'd never sinned. Is that awesome? So not only does he clean you up and not only does he set you apart for himself, but he, he is so good at what he does that your new identity is completely, completely innocent. Have you ever held a baby in your, your arms and looked at this baby and you've said, wow, this baby has so much potential. This baby has not yet told a lie. This baby has not yet lost its temper. I'm talking about really little babies here, okay? <laughs> This baby hasn't done any, it hasn't played in the mud or scraped its knees. There's no scars. There's no evidence of trauma in this. This, okay, this, this is what justified is. When you come to Jesus, Jesus used the term born again, okay? You get a whole new life, a whole new do-over, and it happens because Jesus changes your identity. He just completely reverses your direction. Anybody else think this is good news? I think this is great news. You are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit of our God. Here's what I want you to know. This is so important. Somebody asked me this week uh, uh, about this. What's the difference between a sinner and a Christian? Because the reality is Christians fall into sin, right? So what's the difference between those two things? If you need to study this a little more, you might want to just write this on your note cards if you're taking notes or, or, or just file this in your brain. The best thing to read about this is the New Testament book of 1 John. 1 John makes a distinction between people who practice sin and people who stumble into sin. And he says that if you stumble into sin... You can come to Jesus and you confess your sin and he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then, and then John says, so don't sin. Because if you practice sin, it means you don't love your father. You don't love God, so don't sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate in Jesus and he will argue your case before the father. So 1 John is really cool because it's this challenge, it's this, pu- this, this push and pull of don't sin, but if you do sin, there's forgiveness for you. Don't practice sin because what happens if you practice something? You get really, really good at it, am I right? I, I play piano. My mother made me sit on a piano bench for two hours every day all through high school, okay, because she wanted me to get good at piano, 
okay? If we practice sin, we get really good at it. If you stumble into sin, it doesn't mean that it's your identity. It means you go to Jesus and you confess and you get to be cleansed and sanctified and justified again. It's a difference between practicing and, and stumbling. That's what I want you to hear. And the other thing that I know that a lot of us struggle with is temptation. If I am tempted by a particular sin, especially when it, it has to do with my identity, if I am struggling with a particular temptation, a lot of us believe that defines who we are. And I want you to know you are not defined by your temptations. You are defined by what Jesus has done for you and your position in Christ, which is washed, sanctified, justified. Okay, you get it? Okay, that, that's sermon number one. You didn't know you were getting two of them today. If you've got 1 Corinthians 6 open, uh, we're going to keep reading here in a second. And, and now what I want to do is to pivot to the next part of this chapter in which Paul turns now uh, to the topic of sexual immorality and he gives us a theological explanation of why Christians should run from sexual immorality. If you scan down to... Uh, verse 18, you'll see that he says, run from sexual immorality, or some of your versions will say, flee from sexual immorality. And, and it's not just that he gives us that instruction, but he tells us why we should run from sexual immorality. And I, and I want to unpack this for you this morning. Why should we run from sexual immorality? I grew up in a, in a, in a church environment where preachers would warn us about the terrors of hell and how if you did something bad, you were going to go straight to hell. In fact, um, I, I've, I've performed this little uh, impersonation a couple of times, but it's been a while, so indulge me here. I, I remember being at a youth camp. How many of you went to youth camp? Glacier Bible Camp or something? Okay. I was at a youth camp. This would have been like in the 80s, and, and, and the, the camp speaker there was this older man who loved to, to scare the hell out of us, okay? And, and I remember he preached on how terrible dancing was, okay? Because in those days, dancing led to sex, and sex sent you to hell, okay? So that's how it went. And, and, and he, was, he was just telling these stories about people that went to their prom, and, and his recurring line was, it was her last dance, and she went home in a body bag. And, and that, that, that was it. It was her last dance and she went home in a body bag because something terrible happened because she went dancing, okay? Um, when I was in Bible school, we, we, we kind of realized how ridiculous some of this theology was and we turned it on its head and we used to say, we're not allowed to have premarital sex because it'll lead to dancing. <laughs> okay, so, so did, I, I'm just sharing this with you because we used to talk about how terrible sexual immorality was because it's going to send you to hell. This is not Paul's tack. More recently, I, I know that, that some people, especially working with teenagers, will, will warn teenagers about the dangers of premarital sex because you're going to get a trans, uh, sexually transmitted infection, an STI, and your penis is going to fall off. Okay? And, and, and again, it's scaring you into not doing this stuff. Okay, right? This is not what Paul does. Paul gives us, and, and I think this is incredible, Paul gives us a theology of our bodies. And we're going to read this together, and then I'm going to unpack it for you. Theology of your bodies. Now, here's why theology matters. I want you to understand this. We talk about theology a lot. When Kelly teaches, she talks a lot about theology. This is why. Theology is what you believe about God and what he's done in the world. And what you believe determines how you live. And so if you believe things that are not correct or not true about your body, you are going to do things with your body that are going to lead to destruction. So you need to know what is true about your body. And Paul lays it out for us. This is how God created you. And I think this is really incredible. Okay, so here, here's Paul's big idea, and you'll see this as we read, the, read the, the passage. But this is what I want you to know about your body. You are incredibly valuable to God. 
This is why there's a problem with sexual immorality is because you are incredibly valuable to God. Let me put it a little more explicitly. Your body is incredibly valuable to God. From the very first book of the Bible, this is what we read. God created human beings in his own image. God created human beings in his own image. The second part of that verse that's not on the screen says, male and female, he created them. We are created, including our gender, we are created in the image of God. You bear the stamp of God on your spirit as well as on your body. And you are incredibly valuable to God because you are created in his image. Does that make sense? So now I want to pick up reading in verse 12 of chapter 6. And you're going to see here in this passage that we're going to read uh, three key words. You're going to see the word body. You're going to see the word sexual immorality, which in the Greek language is the word porneia. It's where we get our English word, pornography. But porneia literally means sexual immorality, which in, in Paul's culture, in first century, in biblical culture, what that means is any kind of sexual behavior outside of a marriage relationship between a man and a woman. It's called porneia. Our English translations just call it sexual immorality. Okay? So you're going to see body. You're going to see sexual immorality. The third key word is the word harlot or prostitute. It's the Greek word porne. So porne could be anybody that you indulge in a sexual relationship with outside of marriage. Okay? Porne, porneia. An adulterer, that was in the earlier verse we read, that word is porno. Okay? So they're all related, and it talks about any kind of sexual expression outside of marriage between a man and a woman. Does that make sense? Okay. So now let, let's just read this together, and then, and then we'll break it down. Starting at verse 12. Paul is, again, talking to these people that live in Corinth, and he says, You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. Anybody in this room ever become a slave to something that you thought was a good idea at the beginning and then you found out you couldn't quit? Okay, I mean, we could talk about a lot of things. But he's talking about sex specifically. You say, Corinthians, food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. And this is true, but someday God will do away with both of them. Now, the next verse is where we pick this up. But you cannot say that our bodies were made for porneia. You can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord. And look at this. If, you're, if you have a physical Bible, I would underline this. And the Lord cares about our bodies. That's why I say you are incredibly valuable to God. The Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us from the dead by his power just as he raised our Lord from the dead. The reason he throws that in there is because one of the things that the Corinthians were struggling with was this false teaching that had come into Christian circles in the first, te- in the first century that taught that everything about the body was evil and that God only cared about our spirits. And so what the Corinthians were doing is they, they said, I can do anything with my body as long as I'm nurturing my spiritual, my spiritual relationship with God. Okay, And he's saying, listen your bodies are going to go to heaven with you someday, at the rapture, all that kind of stuff. I don't have time to go into that today, but that's why that's there. Verse 15. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually part of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a porne, a prostitute, or anybody else? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a porne, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say the two are united into one, but the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And here's where he says, now run from sexual immorality. Run from every manifestation of sexual temptation other than that expression within your marriage. Run from porneia. 
And then he says this, no other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. I'm going to tell you what that means in a little bit. Don't you realize that your, mo- your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and who was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So honor God with your body. You are incredibly valuable to God, every part of you. Your spirit is valuable to God. Your body is valuable to God. You are valuable to God. Turn to somebody close to you and say, you are incredibly valuable to God. Okay, now let's talk about three theological statements about your body. Three theological statements about your body from this passage we just read. The first one is this. Your body is joined to the Lord. Your body is joined to the Lord. What that word joined means, it's a marriage word, okay? When Jesus was teaching on marriage in Matthew chapter 19, he said this, quoting Genesis. He said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So when Paul says that your body is joined to the Lord, he's using language, he's using a marriage metaphor, and he says your body was designed to be joined to the Lord. And it's not just a spiritual thing. In marriage, when, when I married Chris, we, we, we join together. One flesh refers to a spiritual joining. It's talking about a, a joining of purpose and life mission. It, it has lots of ramifications, but there's also a physical component to it. We are joined together physically as well as spiritually, emotionally, and all the rest of it. It's true of your relationship with God too. Your body is joined to the Lord. Did you know that God called himself Israel's husband in the Old Testament. God used this marriage language. Look at Isaiah 54 from the Old Testament. It says, for your creator will be your husband. The Lord of heaven's armies is his name. He is your redeemer, the holy one of Israel, the God of all the earth. And here's what I think a lot of us don't realize, because we kind of feel like our bodies are just meant to be indulged and pleasured and do with, with whatever I want to. But God created you and me to be joined to him in a love relationship that is greater than any other love you will ever experience. Did you hear what I said? The love between you and God is designed to be greater than any other love you will ever experience. Some of us in this room are in very, very happy, satisfying relationships. Do you know that the love between you and God is even better than your happy marriage? Some of us in this room are in really crappy marriages. Good news for you, there's a better love for you. And it's not in the arms of another woman or another man. God designed you to have this incredible love. And if you're not married yet, I, I, rem- I was 31 when I got married. I remember the loneliness of singlehood. But you know what? God loved me really well in those years. And if you're waiting, I want you to know the wait is worth it because you can press into this relationship with God that is better than any relationship you will ever have with a human being. So in verse 15, we read it already. Paul says, don't you realize your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Some of your your translations might say members of Christ. Again, that's that's a marriage term. Should a man take his body, which is a part or a member of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. Why? Well, because if we are joined to the Lord in 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 a marriage kind of relationship. Do you know what unfaithfulness does to God's heart? God experiences profound grief. And and later on, again, I would encourage you to do a little reading on your own. 
In the Old Testament book of Hosea, chapter 2, God describes how he married the nation Israel and how they cheated on him. And if you read that chapter, you're seeing that his grief goes through all the cycles of grief. It starts with anger. He is so angry at Israel for abandoning him. And then there's some denial, and, and then, and then he's, he, he, he determines to reconcile with her and do whatever he, it takes. to Listen, God grieves. God grieves when you and I cheat on him with our body. Now, if you have any relationship with God at all, this should move you emotionally to say, I don't want to break God's heart because God's been so good to me. Why would I intentionally inflict pain on him when he's been so good to me? Your body is joined to the Lord and you are incredibly valuable to him. Am I making you think a little bit? It's kind of cool, right? Here's the second theological statement. Second theological statement Paul makes is this. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, last week when we were in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it said all of you together are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It was talking about the church. It was talking about all of us together. God's presence deep dwells with us together. Now in this chapter, he's talking to individuals and he says, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Look at verse 19. Paul says, don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? And, 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 And here's what he's envisioning. In, in Paul's day, there was still a temple in Jerusalem. When Jesus walked the earth, he spent time in the temple, and it was this huge structure in which the Jews believed that God's physical presence dwelled. And and when you went into this temple, there were all these all these different parts of the temple. There was a courtyard, and then you went inside, and then on the very inner part of it, there was a veil that was like six feet thick, all right? And behind the veil was where God's physical presence dwelt. God's presence rested in that temple. And do you know how how reverent the priests were to that holy place that when they would go in there, they sewed bells on the bottom of of, of their robes because they believed that that place was so holy that if they walked in and they were unworthy, that they would immediately die from exposure to God's presence. Now, I don't know if anybody ever did die, but they had this reverence for the temple and the presence of God. So when Paul says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, what he's trying to to raise up in us is this understanding that God's presence lives right here and we ought to have this incredible reverence for him. And, And we should take great care what we do with these bodies because we reverence the presence of his spirit. And in particular, sexual immorality is is repelling to the presence that dwells in us. And again, it's not that it's unforgivable or that you can't be cleansed and sanctified and justified. You absolutely can. But once his presence dwells in you, there ought to be this awe. Awe! The presence of God is right here. Do Do you hear what I'm saying? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're incredibly valuable to God. Here's the last theological statement I'm going to talk about today. Your body was bought by God. Did you catch it at the very end of that passage when we read it together? It said your body was bought by God with a high price. Eugene Peterson uh, wrote the Message Bible. And this is how he put verse 20. He said, the physical part of you is not some piece of property belonging to the spiritual part of you. God owns the whole works. Isn't that interesting? 
Now, when I was studying this, I struggled a little, with, a little bit because this idea that God bought you with a high price, this is actually slavery language. Slavery was very common in first century Corinth. People understood the concept of slavery. For us, that's repellent. And, and we all say, I, I, I don't want to be a slave to anybody, right? I, I, that, I, I, I don't, why, why should I be a slave to God? But the reality is Jesus already knows that we're slaves to sin. Did you know you're a slave to something? And the beautiful, beautiful part is that, that Jesus draws us in and he says, I, I want you to come to me. Bob Dylan, do you remember? Some of you are old enough to remember Bob Dylan. He said, you got to serve somebody, okay? And it might, be the, it might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. Bob Dylan, what, what, was that in the 60s or 70s? Anybody remember? I mean, whenever that was, Bob Dylan, this, this greasy rocker, this rock and roller, he knew that everybody served somebody. And God bought you with a high price. Why? Because he wants you to be his instead of the devil's. This is how Peter put it in 1 Peter chapter 1. He said, you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it wasn't paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It's the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. That's a high price. He bought your bodies with his own body. But then this is what's incredible. Jesus said in John 15, I don't call you slaves any longer, but I call you my friends. So being a slave to God is really good because you get to be best buddies with him. And like I, I've said several times today, God the Father calls us sons and daughters. So in, even though he paid this price for you and me, a slave price, then he brings us into this family and we become his friends and his sons and daughters. We're no longer slaves. We're in this incredibly honoring relationship. It's, in, it's, it's incredible. And this is why Paul says, you are incredibly valuable to God. Now the end of Paul's argument is what I've already mentioned. Paul commands us emphatically, run from sexual immorality. Don't just resist. Don't just try to quit. Roll your eyes a little bit and go, huh, I don't know if I can do that. He says, turn and run. He's really using language that echoes the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. Do you remember this story? Joseph was a servant in the, in the Pharaoh's household actually in one of Pharaoh's servants, Potiphar. Potiphar's wife wanted to sleep with Joseph. And he understood this principle that I need to run from sexual immorality. And when she, when she came on to him, he turned and fled and, and she grabbed his clothes and ripped them off and he ran away naked. He, he, it was better for him to just run through the streets naked than to cheat on his relationship with God. Paul uses that same language and says, run from it. Flee from it. Don't entertain it. Don't, don't tiptoe around it. And, and he says the reason why is that sexual immorality doesn't just affect God, but it affects you differently than any other sin. If you've ever wondered what that means, this is what I think it means. When you engage in sexual immorality, you remove your body from the ownership of God and you give it to somebody else. And that affects you because all of a sudden you experience separation from God. It happens like this. Now, if you have ever sinned sexually in any way, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Because immediately, shame comes in, and guilt, and you feel dirty. And the last thing you want to do is go talk to God about it, right? 
And so it becomes this, it becomes almost an addictive cycle. Well, in a lot of ways, it is an addictive cycle because the shame makes you want to just do it more because you figure, well, I've already done it. I might as well just keep going. And I don't want to talk to God about it because I feel shame. And so I'm just going to keep going and keep going and keep going. It's so detrimental to us as well as breaking God's heart. Why? Because it's broken the relationship that we have with God. It's not about your body parts falling off and getting a terrible disease, although that's awful. I wouldn't wish that on any of you. The deeper question is, this will affect your relationship with God in ways that you sometimes can't imagine when you have a desire or a temptation or an opportunity and you think YOLO, <laughs> think again, because you are incredibly valuable to God and he just wants to have a relationship with you. Don't compromise that. Do you know how crazy he is about you? He loves you more than you can even imagine. And this is how I want to end. Musicians, why don't you come? <coughs> I want to end with this. Uh, you're, you are so incredibly valuable to God. Go to the next slide. I want to spend some time today praying for you. Because I want you to experience this. I want you to experience the taking of this identity of sinner and moving it into your past so you can, you can say, whoo, that's past tense, Russell. Such were some of you. And I want you to experience present tense whatever your name is. And I want you to be able to look at yourself and say, whoa, I've been washed. I've been sanctified. I've been justified because I had an encounter with Jesus. That's what I want to pray for today. So would you put your things aside? Just free up your hands, would you? <laughs> Would you, would you close your eyes and, uh, and what I'd like you to do is uh, I want you to give everybody in the room their own privacy, okay? Because we're just going to do some business with God and I don't want anybody in the room to feel like anybody else is looking, okay? And I want to I pray for you very specifically if today you need to move your identity into that past tense thing. And, and you need to be able to look at this verse on the screen and say, such was I, past tense. I used to live there, but now I've been washed and sanctified and justified. Today you're going to make a shift in the spiritual realm into a whole new identity. And I'm going to pray for you. Okay, and, and I want to pray for you specifically. So with literally, absolutely nobody looking around. If you want me to pray for you, will you raise your hand right where you are? I'm not going to make you come up. There, there's going to be no shame. There's going to be no calling out. I just, just me, I'm the only one looking, and I'm going to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Who else? Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. I saw three hands. Anybody else today? Don't be shy. I really want you to experience this incredible grace that God has for you today. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for that.
Okay, now pray with me, would you please? If, if you're full of the Holy Spirit, would you just begin to pray in the Spirit as we invite uh, the Lord to begin to do a powerful work in each of these people? It, it took a lot of courage to just raise a hand on this topic, right? So would you begin to pray in the Spirit? And, and I'm going to pray, and uh, let's see what Jesus does today. Jesus, today I want to start by just saying thank you for purchasing us, purchasing these bodies with, with your own blood and, and going to the cross and being willing to die so that we could be reconnected to God in the most profound way. Jesus, those of us that have raised our hands today, we're just saying, I need to move from an identity of sinner and an identity of, of failure. I need to move into this identity of I've, I've been washed and sanctified and justified. So right now as I'm praying, Jesus, I want to pray that you will begin to give us this incredible shower. Every person that raised a hand today, Lord, will you begin the washing process? Will you just begin scrubbing away the stains? Will you begin to heal the scars? Because for a lot of us, Lord, we're bearing the scars of, of choices we've made. And we have regret and we have shame and we, and, and we just feel like we smell bad. I mean, that's the truth. So Jesus, will you scrub us completely clean? It's what you do. The scriptures say that you take our sins and you remove them from us as far as the east is from the west. You just take them away. Other places in the scripture, it says you bury our sins in the deepest sea. Another scripture says you don't remember our sins anymore. That's how complete the cleansing is. And I'm praying that, Lord, for these four people, five people maybe who raise their hands today, Lord, for an incredible cleansing, an incredible washing so that all of that old junk will be gone. And then Jesus, right now, we just say yes to your sanctification. We're no longer sinners. We are holy. We're standing with our heads held high because you made us holy. And we are justified. We're born again. This is a brand new beginning. I don't have to, I, I, I don't have to feel like I'm walking in this old pattern anymore. You've changed me into a brand new person. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.